Once Upon a Dream, A Twisted Tale by Lise Preswell Chapter 4 Deux Dames Jolies Without thinking about it, Aurora used her thumbnail to crease the spine to see if it felt like a real feather. It did. She trilled it between her fingers thoughtfully. There were still pigeons, of course, quite a flock of them in the courtyards now, which peasants occasionally trap for dinner, not always trusting magical food. They didn't have feathers like these. There were some chickens and dogs left, but even the prettiest, most irises and winged drakes didn't support a blue of this purity. There were a few descendants of foreign birds from the jungles kept safe in golden cages, but the blue ones were very light, like the tiny flowers in ancient tapestries, not like these. She held the feather before her as she much more thoughtfully made her way to her room. Aurora lived in a prettily decorated suit on the second floor of the castle. All the surviving royalty and lesser nobles lived in the main keep, as well as those foreign dignitaries trapped in the kingdom when the world outside finally collapsed. The lesser survivors, the peasants and servants, lived in a hastily erected shanty town in one of the larger courtyards of the bailey. If Aurora didn't look too hard at the thick vines covering her window and there was a good strong lantern glowing, she could pretend it was a completely normal royal princess's bedroom. There was a frothy and beribboned pink canopy bed on a raised dais, a wardrobe with gilt moldings in which hung a stunning number of beautiful gowns, a vanity with a picture and basin of beaten silver, a tiny couch with silk pillows, and a lovely little table by the fireplace with long, elegant legs. There was also a bookcase full of books that hadn't worked properly since the world had ended. Most were missing great patches of text and illustrations. Many were simply blank. The words that remained were often in languages that weren't even real. An effect Maleficent had explained of the world destroying evil magics that King Stephen and Queen Leah had unleashed. They had literally broken the land and the minds and inventions of men. The Queen's powers were not great enough to restore everything fully. They were barely enough to keep the remaining population alive. And so the books remained mostly blank, and cloth had to be woven from thread summoned by magic. Spinning wheels hadn't functioned the way they were supposed to in half a decade. Right then, Aurora's bed looked especially inviting. The servants had made it up all plump and pretty, and she did love dancing and she was going to be up late that night. There was also the little matter that when she wasn't thrilling, her favorite thing was lying down and dreaming the hours away. Her bed was always her favorite place to be. She could spend the entire day in the dark under its covers. Eventually, night would come and sometimes things were more interesting at night. As much as anything was ever interesting in the castle at the end of the world. And when the nights weren't particularly interesting, well, at least she had passed another of the endless days away. She gave in, collapsing on her back onto the fat mattress full of feathers. She trilled the blue feather in her fingers. She had never seen the minstrel in any of the outer courtyards or baileys. He tended to stick to shadows, internal rooms, secluded areas, like a burglar or a cat. Bright light hurt his addict's eyes, and he was more uncomfortable than most looking up at the giant vines that blocked the sky. Perhaps that's what he meant by being outside, not outside. Poor, crazy, drunken fool. She sighed and reached up over her head to grab one of the broken books. 
one with an easily memorable design on its cover and started to place the feather between its heavy, insane pages. At the last moment, she changed her mind and put it in the little silver pouch attached to her girdle by her shadow line. A once living thing, wherever it was from, didn't deserve to be pressed like an inanimate object, filled away like an ancient manuscript. The princess would keep it with her until she figured out what to do with it. She thought of a different feather she owned and let out another sigh. Instead of going to sleep, she sat down at her pretty little table, took up her white swan quill, and set herself to solving the math problems on a precious scrap of vellum before her. After fortifying the castle, making living arrangements for all within and working out whatever magical source of food she managed, Maleficent had turned to Aurora's education. The king and queen had neglected everything for their unwanted daughter. Basic reading and writing skills, little work, the sort of useful hobbies royal ladies were supposed to know, even etiquette and geography, the new queen immediately set out to rectify this with a half dozen tutors, adding things to the mix that were necessarily princessy, like math, which Aurora was terrible at. Some things came to her naturally, singing, playing the recorder, kindness, patience ensuing, even if it would be years before her needle skills were up to that of a 12 years old. Her fingers were often covered in tiny pinpricks from embroidery, and Maleficent had suggested, with a kind laugh, that she put off carding and spinning until she could be trusted with the sharp point of a drop spindle. But numbers and anything having to do with numbers. That was another thing entirely. Aurora privately wondered if there was a reason princesses weren't taught math or alchemy or the workings of the world. Maybe they just couldn't grasp it. Still, she forced herself to pay attention when the old castle treasurer patiently demonstrated the magic of adding and substrating amounts with tally sticks and Abasi, and the castle carpenter showed her the measurement of forms with string and weights. When she tried to do the exact same problems on her own, however, they never made sense. The numbers swam in front of her, and the little counting lines seemed to multiply of their own volition. Her ability to draw was negligible, and her squares often looked like mush. But Maleficent was trying so hard with her adopted knees that Aurora forced herself to keep working in secret, in private. She kept herself going by imagining the look on her aunt's face when she finally showed how she could divide an ink flock of sheep into five equal smaller herds. Aurora drew a tiny, ugly scribble of a sheep. Then she drew four more. She counted them. There were five. She drew two more farther away. Now there were six. Aurora frowned, looking at the paper. Maybe seven? Eight? She tried it on her fingers, pretending each one was a warm white ball of wool. Did you count the beginning one and the last one too? Or was it like pages of a book, where you didn't count both ends? She spent ten more minutes trying to make the two groups of sheep add up. She was pretty sure it was around seven, but the lack of precision was giving her a headache. Finally, she threw herself on her bed in frustration. She would never be as smart and powerful and elegant as her aunt.